Chapter 7 A week of buffeting, a tempestuous and relentless sea, a week of seasickness and deserted cabins, of lonely quarter decks drenched with spray, spray so ambitious that it even coated the smokestacks thick with a white crust of salt to their very tops. A week of shivering in the shelter of the lifeboats and deckhouses by day, and blowing suffocating clouds, and boisterously performing at dominoes in the smoking rooms at night. And the last night of the seven was the stormiest of all. There was no thunder, no noise but the pounding bows of the ship, the keen whistling of the gale through the cordage and the rush of the seething waters. But the vessel climbed aloft as if she would climb to heaven, then paused an instant and seemed a century and plunged headlong down again as from a precipice. The sheeted sprays drenched the decks like rain. The blackness of darkness was everywhere. At long intervals a flash of lightning clove it like a quivering line of fire that revealed a heaving world of water where nothing was before, kindled the dusky cordage to glittering silver and lit up the faces of the men with a ghastly luster. Fear drove many on deck that were used to avoiding the night winds and the spray. Some thought the vessel could not live through the night, and it seemed less dreadful to stand out in the midst of the wild tempest and see the peril that threatened than to be shut up in the sepulchre cabins under the dim lamps and imagine the horrors that were abroad on the ocean. And once out, once where they could see the ship struggling in the strong grasp of the storm, once where they could hear the shriek of the winds and face the driving spray and look out upon the majestic picture the lightnings disclosed. They were prisoners to a fierce fascination they could not resist, and so remained. It was a wild night, and a very, very long one. Everybody was sent scampering to the deck at seven o'clock this lovely morning of the 30th of June, with the glad news that land was in sight. It was a rare thing and joyful to see all the ship's family abroad once more, albeit the happiness that sat upon every countenance could only partly conceal the ravages which that long siege of storms had wrought there. But dull eyes soon sparkled with pleasure, pallid cheeks flushed again, and frames weakened by sickness gathered new life from the quickening influence of the bright fresh morning yea and from a still more potent influence the worn castaways were to see the blessed land again and to see it was to bring back that motherland that was in all their thoughts within the hour we were fairly within the straits of gibraltar the tall yellow splotched hills of africa on our right with their bases veiled in a blue haze, and their summits swathed in clouds, the same being accorded to Scripture, which says that clouds and darkness are all over the land. The words were spoken of this particular portion of Africa, I believe. On our left were the granite-ribbed domes of old Spain. The strait is only thirteen miles wide in its narrowest part. At short intervals along the Spanish shore there were quaint-looking old stone towers, Moorish, we thought, but learned better afterwards. In former times the Morocco rascals used to coast along the Spanish main in their boats till a safe opportunity seemed to present itself, and then dart in and capture a Spanish village and carry off all the pretty women they could find. It was a pleasant business and was very popular. The Spaniards built these watchtowers on the hills to enable them to keep a sharper lookout on their Moroccan speculators. 
picture on the other hand was very beautiful to eyes weary of the changeless sea and by and by the ship's company grew wonderfully cheerful but while we stood admiring the cloud-capped peaks and the lowlands robed in a misty gloam a finer picture burst upon us and chained every eye like a magnet a stately ship with canvas piled on canvas till she was one towering mass of billowing sail she came speeding over the sea like a great bird africa and spain were forgotten all homage was to the beautiful stranger while everybody gazed she swept by superbly and flung the stars and stripes to the breeze quicker than thought hats and handkerchiefs flashed in the air and a cheer went up she was beautiful before she was radiant now many a one on our decks knew that for the first time how tame a sight his country's flag is at home compared to what it is in a foreign land to see it is to see a vision of home itself and all its idols and feel a thrill that would stir the very river of sluggish blood we were approaching the famed pillars of hercules and already the african one apes hill a grand old mountain with summits streaked with granite ledges was in sight the other the great rock of gibraltar was yet to come the ancients considered the pillars of hercules the head of navigation and the end of the world the information the ancients didn't have was very voluminous even the prophets wrote book after book and epistle after epistle it never once hinted at the existence of a great continent on our side of the water yet they must have known it was there i should think and in a few moments a lonely and enormous mass of rock standing seemingly in the center of a wide strait and apparently washed on all sides by the sea swung magnificently into view and we needed no tedious traveled parrot to tell us it was gibraltar there could not be two rocks like that in one kingdom the rock of gibraltar is about a mile and a half long i should say by fourteen to fifteen hundred feet high and a quarter of a mile wide at its base one side and one end of it come about as straight up out of the sea as the side of a house the other end is irregular and the other side is a steep slant which an army would find very difficult to climb at the foot of this slant is the walled town of gibraltar or rather the town occupies part of the slant and everywhere on hillside in the precipice by the sea on the heights and everywhere you choose to look gibraltar is clad with masonry and bristling with guns it makes a striking and lively picture from whatsoever point you can contemplate it it is pushed out into the sea on the on the end of a flat narrow strip of land and is suggestive of a gob of mud on the end of a shingle a few hundred yards of this flat ground at its base belongs to the english and then extending across the strip from the atlantic to the mediterranean a distance of a quarter of a mile comes the neutral ground a space two or three hundred yards wide which is free to both parties are you going through spain to paris that question was bandied about the ship day and night from fayal to gibraltar and i thought i'd never get so tired of hearing any one combination of words again or more tired of answering i don't know at the last moment six or seven had sufficient decision of character to make up their minds to go and did go and i felt a sense of relief at once it was forever too late now and i could make up my mind at my leisure not to go i must have a prodigious quantity of mind it takes me as much as a week sometimes to make it up but behold how annoyances repeat themselves 
we had no sooner gotten rid of the Spain distress than the Gibraltar guide started another, a tiresome repetition of a legend that had nothing very astonishing about it, even in the first place. That high hill yonder is called the Queen's Chair is because one of the queens of Spain placed her chair there when the French and Spanish troops were besieging Gibraltar and said she would never move from that spot till the English flag was lowered from the fortress. And if the English hadn't been gallant enough to lower the flag for a few hours one day, she'd have had to break her oath or die up there. Well, we rode on asses and mules up the steep, narrow streets and entered the subterranean galleries the English had blasted out of the rock. These galleries are like spacious railway tunnels, and at short intervals send them great guns frown out upon the sea and town through portholes five or six hundred feet above the ocean. There is a mile or so of this subterranean work, and a must have cost a vast deal of money and labor. The gallery guns command the peninsula and the harbors of both oceans, but they might as well not be there, I should think, for an army could hardly climb the perpendicular wall of the rock anyhow. Those lofty portals afford superb views of the sea, though. At one place there's a jutting crag it was hollowed out in a great chamber whose furniture was huge cannon and whose windows were portholes a glimpse was caught of a hill not far away and a soldier said that high hill yonder is called the queen's chair it's because a queen of spain placed her chair there once when the french and spanish troops were besieging gibraltar and said she would never move from that spot till the english flag was lowered from the fortress if the English hadn't been gallant enough to lower the flag for a few hours one day, she'd have had to break her oath or die up there. Well, on the topmost pinnacle of Gibraltar, we halted a good while. And no doubt the mules were tired. They had a right to be. The military road was good, but rather steep, and there was a good deal of it. The view from the narrow ledge was magnificent. From it, vessels seeming like uh, tiniest little toy boats were turned into noble ships by the telescopes. And other vessels that were fifty miles away, and even sixty, they said, and invisible to the naked eye, could be clearly distinguished through the same telescopes. Below, on one side, we looked down upon an endless mass of batteries, and on the other, straight down to the sea while I was resting ever so comfortably on a rampart and cooling my baking head in the delicious breeze, an officious guide belonging to another party came up and said, Senor, that high hill yonder is called the Queen's Chair. Sir, I'm a helpless orphan in a foreign land. Have pity on me. Don't now don't inflict that most infernal old legend on me any more today. There, I had used strong language after promising I would never do so again. But the provocation was more than human nature could bear. If you had been so bored when you had a noble panorama of Spain and Africa and the blue Mediterranean spread abroad at your feet and wanted to gaze and enjoy and surfeit yourself in its beauty and silence you might have even burst into stronger language than i did well gibraltar has stood several protracted sieges one of them of nearly four years duration it failed and the english only captured it by stratagem the wonder is that anybody should ever dream of trying so impossible a project as the taking of it by assault, and yet it has been tried more than once. The Moors held the place twelve hundred years ago, and a staunch old castle of theirs of that date still frowns from the middle of the town, with moss-grown battlements and sides well scarred by shots fired in battles and sieges that are forgotten now. 
A secret chamber in the rock behind it was discovered some time ago, which contained a sword of exquisite workmanship and some quaint old armor of a fashion that antiquaries are not acquainted with, though it is supposed to be Roman. Roman armor and Roman relics of various kinds have been found in a cave in the sea extremity of Gibraltar. History says Rome held this part of the country about the Christian era, and these things seem to confirm that statement. In that cave also were found human bones, crusted with a very thick, stony coating, and wise men have ventured to say that those men have not only lived before the flood, but as much as ten thousand years before it. It may be true, it looks reasonable enough, but as long as those parties can't vote any more, the matter can be of no great public interest. In this cave, likewise, are found skeletons and fossils of animals that exist in every part of Africa, yet within memory and tradition have never existed in any portion of Spain, save this lone peak of Gibraltar. So the theory is that the channel between Gibraltar and Africa was once dry land, and that the low, neutral neck between Gibraltar and the Spanish hills behind it was once ocean. And of course that these uh, African animals, being over at Gibraltar after rock, perhaps, there's plenty there, got closed out when the great change occurred. The hills in Africa across the channel are full of apes, and they are now, and always have been apes on the rock of Gibraltar, but not anywhere else in Spain. The subject is an interesting one. There's an English garrison at Gibraltar of 6,000 or 7,000 men, and so uniforms of flaming red are plenty, and red and blue and undressed costumes of snowy white and also the queer uniform of the bare-kneed Highlander. And one sees soft-eyed Spanish girls from San Roque and veiled Moorish beauties. I suppose they are beauties. From Tarifa and turban sashed and trousered Moorish merchants from Fez and long-robed, bare-legged, ragged Mohammedan vagabonds from Tetuan and Tangier some brown, some yellow, some as black as virgin ink, and Jews from all around, in gabardine, skull-cap and slippers, just as they are in pictures and theaters, and just as they were three thousand years ago, no doubt. You can easily understand that a tribe, somehow our pilgrims suggest that expression, because they march in a straggling procession through these foreign places, with such an Indian-like air of complacency and independence about them. Like ours, made up from fifteen or sixteen states of the Union, found enough to stare at in this shifting panorama of fashion today. Speaking of our pilgrims reminds me that we have one or two people along who are sometimes an annoyance. However, I do not count the oracle in that list. I will explain that the oracle is an innocent old ass who eats for four and looks wiser than the whole Academy of France would have any right to look, and never uses a one-syllable word when he can think of a longer one, and never by any possible chance knows the meaning of any long word he uses or ever gets it in the right place. Yet he will serenely venture an opinion on the most abstruse subject and back it up complacently with quotations from authors who never existed, and finally when cornered will slide to the other side of the question, say he's been there all the time, and come back at you with your own spoken arguments, only with the big words all tangled, and play them in your own very own teeth as original with himself. He reads a chapter in the guidebooks, mixes the facts all up with his bad memory, and then goes off to inflict the whole mess on somebody as wisdom which has been festering in his brain for years, and which he gathered in college from erudite authors who are dead now and out of print. 
This morning at breakfast he pointed out the window and said, You see that there hill over there on the African coast? It's one of them pillows of Hercules, I should say, and that's the ultimate one alongside of it. The ultimate one, that's a good word, but the pillars are not both on the same side of the strait. I saw he had been deceived by a carelessly written sentence in the guidebook. Well, it ain't for you to say, nor for me. Some authors state it that way, and some states it different. Old Gibbons don't say nothing about it, just shirks it complete. Gibbons always done that when he got stuck. But there's Roll Ampton, and what does he say? Why, he says that they was both on the same side and Trinculian, and Sobaster, and Syracuse, and Langamargamble. Oh, that will do. That's enough. If you've got your hand in for inventing authors and testimony, I have nothing more to say. Let them be on the same side. We don't mind the Oracle. We rather like him. We can tolerate the Oracle very easily. But we have a poet and a good-natured enterprising idiot on board, and they do distress the company. The one gives copies of his verses to consuls, commanders, hotel keepers, Arabs, Dutch, to anybody, in fact, who will submit to a grievous infliction most kindly met. His poetry is all very well on shipboard, notwithstanding when he wrote an ode to the ocean in a storm, in one half hour, and an apostrophe to the rooster in the waist of the ship in the next. The transition was considered to be rather abrupt, but when he sends an invoice of rhymes to the governor of Fayal and another to the commander-in-chief and other dignitaries in Gibraltar with compliments of the laureate of the ship, it is not popular with the passengers. The other personage I have mentioned is young and green and not bright, not learned and not wise. He will be, though, some day if he recollects the answers to all his questions. He is known about the ship as the interrogation point, and this by constant use has become shortened to interrogation. He has distinguished himself twice already. In Fayal, they pointed out a hill and told him that it was 800 feet high and 1,100 feet long. And they told him that there was a tunnel 2,000 feet long and 1,000 feet high running through the hill from end to end. He believed it. He repeated it to everybody, discussed it, and read it from his notes. Finally, he took a useful hint from this remark, which a thoughtful old pilgrim made. Well, yes, it is a little remarkable, singular tunnel altogether. Stands out at the top of the hill about 200 feet, and one, of, one end of it sticks out of the hill about 900. Here in Gibraltar, he corners these educated British officers and badgers them with braggadocio about America and the wonders she can perform. He told one of them that a couple of our gunboats could come here and knock Gibraltar into the Mediterranean Sea. Well, at this present moment, half a dozen of us are taking a private pleasure excursion of our own devising. We form rather more than half the list of the white passengers on board a small steamer bound for the venerable Moorish town of Tangier, Africa. Nothing could be more absolutely certain than that we are enjoying ourselves. One cannot do otherwise who speeds over these sparkling water and breathes the soft atmosphere of this sunny land. Care cannot assail us here. We are out of its jurisdiction. We even steamed recklessly by the frowning fortress of Malabad, a stronghold of the Emperor of Morocco, without a tinge of fear. The whole garrison turned out under arms and assumed a threatening attitude, yet still we did not fear. The entire garrison marched and countermarched within the rampart 
in full view notwithstanding even this we never flinched i suppose we really do not know what fear is i inquired the name of the garrison of the fortress of malabad and they said it was Mah mahomet ali ben sankum i said it would be a good idea to get some more garrisons to help him but they said no he had nothing to do but hold the place and he was competent to do that and had done it two years already that was evidence which one could not well refute there's nothing like reputation every now and then my glove purchase in gibraltar last night intrudes itself upon me dan and the ship's surgeon and i had been up to the great square listening to the music of the fine military bands and contemplating english and spanish female loveliness and fashion and at nine o'clock we were on our way to the theatre when we met the general the judge the commodore the colonel and the commissioner of the united states of america to europe asia and africa who had been to the clubhouse to register their several titles and impoverish the bill of fare and they told us to go over to the little variety store on near the hall of justice and buy some kid gloves they said they were elegant and very moderate in price it seemed a stylish thing to go to the theater in kid gloves and we acted upon the hint a very handsome young lady in the store offered me a pair of blue gloves i did not want blue but she said they would look very pretty on a hand like mine the remark touched me tenderly i glanced furtively at my hand and somehow it did seem a rather comely member i tried a glove on my left hand and blushed a little manifestly the size was too small for me but i felt gratified when she said oh it is just right yet i knew it was no such thing i tugged at it diligently but it was discouraging work she said ah i see you are accustomed to wearing kid gloves but some gentlemen are so awkward about putting them on it was the last compliment i expected i only understood putting on a buckskin article perfectly i made another effort and tore the glove from the base of the thumb into the palm of the hand and tried to hide the rent she kept up her compliments and i kept up my determination to deserve them or die ah you have had experience i ripped down the back of the hand they are just right for you your hand is very small if they tear you need not pay for them a rent across the middle i can always tell when a gentleman understands putting on kid gloves there is a grace about it that only comes with long practice the whole afterguard of the glove fetched away as the sailors say the fabric parted across the knuckles and nothing was left but a melancholy ruin i was too much flattered to make an exposure and throw the merchandise on the angel's hands i was hot vexed confused but still happy but i hated the other boys for taking such an absorbing interest in the proceedings i wish they were in jericho i felt exquisitely mean when i said cheerfully this one does very well it fits elegantly i like a glove that fits no never mind ma'am never mind i'll put the other one on in the street it is warm here it was warm it was the warmest place i ever was i paid the bill and as i passed out with a fascinating bow i thought i detected a light in the woman's eye that was gently ironical and when i looked back from the street she was laughing all to herself about something or other i said to myself with withering sarcasm oh certainly you know how to put on kid gloves don't you a self-complacent ass ready to be flattered out of your senses by every petticoat that chooses to take the trouble to do it well the silence of the boys annoyed me finally dan said musingly 
Some gentlemen don't know how to put on kid gloves at all, but some do. And the doctor said, to the moon, I thought. But it's always easy to tell when a gentleman is used to putting on kid gloves. Dan soliloquized after a pause. Ah, yes, there is a grace about it that only comes with long, very long practice. Yes, indeed, I've noticed that when a man hauls on a kid glove, like he was dragging a cat out of an ash hole by the tail. He understands putting on kid gloves. He's had ex boys. Enough of a thing's enough. You think you are very smart, I suppose, but I don't. And if you go and tell any of those old gossips in the ship about this thing, I'll never forgive you for it. That's all. They let me alone then for the time being. We always let each other alone in time to prevent ill feeling from spoiling a joke. But they had bought gloves too, as I did, and we all threw our purchases away together this morning. They were coarse, unsubstantial, freckled all over with broad yellow splotches, and could neither stand wear nor public exhibition. We had entertained an angel unawares, but we did not take her in. She did that for us. Tangier. A tribe of stalwart moors are wading into the sea to carry us ashore on their backs from the small boats. 